Uh, we didn't do that tonight, but this is a 19th century picture, and it's all of the landscape that I grew up in. It's um, in West Sussex, and that 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 lump on the hill is is Chanting Berry Ring. It was the site of the Roman temple, and it was sort of the view from uh, from our house. This is, when I, I was really interested in science when I was at school and at some point uh, around when I was 15 I started to become disenchanted with science and um, started wondering about the arts and photography was a kind of bridge I think for myself to cross from the world of, the world of, um, of science using Photography, the, the science of photography, the science in photography, the optics, the chemistry, the mechanics, the physics of, of photography, to to cross over this bridge into the world of image, which I believe is um, totally separated from the world of science. So my, this is one of my early uh, photographic efforts. Uh, I was sitting around waiting for this owl to fly out of this hollow tree. Uh, we, in school, we had a society, a photographic society, and we would meet occasionally. Uh, we, the older, I went to a boarding school in England, the older boys would teach, uh, teach you how to process film. So that, that was my beginning. And I got into photography because I had a friend who was really into the equipment. And, um, That, that, that's how I got into it. It was really this kind of fascination with um, kind of the, the gadgetry of the whole idea of photography. I mean, making pictures was totally beside the point. It was, you know, big zoom lenses and motor drives and this kind of stuff. And I hadn't been exposed to that at all. I didn't know there was such a thing as you know, fine art photography or anything other than commercial photography or amateur photography. Oh, that's a huge leap. Um, so this is kind of the end of some sort of naive experimentation in England. And um, I made a trip to America. And... Um, This is a drawing of an experience I had in New Hampshire.
that I had inherited from my uncle. And I, I, was, trying to, I was trying to make things that looked a little different from, from what I'd seen in the pictures I'd been making. There was an extraordinary moment in, the, in New York then, because, especially in Williamsburg, because probably, probably two-thirds of the buildings had been abandoned. And I found myself just wandering around in these, um, these places that people had been not so long ago. It was a kind of, a kind of archaeology of the county. So I just wandered around and see, uh, look, look for what um, what was what was in those spaces? That's a toilet, for those of you that can't see that. It, you know, it's a photograph made by um, just m multiple flashing and moving the camera. Are you showing these prints or images to anybody at this point? No, the, these pictures were on slide, and at that time I didn't have any money to think about printing them properly, so they've actually remained unprinted. I, I showed them only once uh, during that period at a slideshow at the Pyramid Club. I don't think anyone was interested. That's a, um, a dead dog I came across, and the paint uh, from the ceiling had been falling on top of it. The environment was haunted. I mean, that's how he felt. I mean, these people had, had been there, these fam families, photographs stuck onto walls. At some point I got out of the empty buildings, it started getting dangerous and started playing around in my studio, my apartment, and this was one of those attempts at making a different kind of picture, making a picture rather than taking it, where I shone light on a person while they were moving pinholes um, in a slide, making, taking a slide putting holes in the, in, the, in the slide and just shining the light of, on, on a person and the person's moving. Can show the person? <laughs> I didn't pick up on it immediately. That's an arm there, that's the head and another arm. I remembered I remembered um, that a teacher at school, when I when I first showed him my photographs, I I apologized uh, because I didn't have a very good camera, and he told me that I could take the best pictures in the world with a pinhole camera, and so at some point I decided that that I wanted to explore that, and I started experimenting with a pinhole camera. And for those of you that don't know, it's a, uh, a lensless camera. The, the aperture that, um, that information enters the cameras is literally a pinhole in a piece of metal. So this, this is a uh, pinhole photograph in a kaleidoscope. It's called Prayer for Rebecca.
This piece is called Sun Sun. It's also a pinhole photograph. And it's, um, it's a construction made to be photographed with the pinhole camera. Like a set, a set, a stage developed specifically for the eye for this camp of this camera, which is just a cardboard box with a hole in it. And I felt um, one of the reasons that I started this work was that I wanted to make prints that, that the prior color work had been invisible in a way. And I wanted to I wanted to make something I could I could um, that wasn't invisible. Those color pictures in the empty buildings I I've been showing them to to a, cer a circle of friends and their encouragement um, really helped me to continue my work in photography. For employment, I had a job at the I was a waiter at the uh, Metropolitan Museum and. I used to wear parties there in the evening. And sometimes I find myself wandering through the galleries, the sculpture galleries, at, in the dark, alone. And it was quite profound to be amongst those incredible, incredible sculptures, um, sculptures that had so, so many um, ideas attached to them, uh, myths and uh, depictions of uh, deities, and I mean, essentially kind of religious objects. And it, it was, a, it was a, an enormous contrast to see, see those things in the, in the museum environment in the day, contrasted with how I felt about them at night, walking through, walking through the galleries. And so I set about this project to see if I could recapture some of that poetry that I felt photographically. Are these large in scale? It's an 8 by 10 negative printed to 20 by 24 inches. And these made up my first exhibition in 1985 in the, the Massimo Alvi LA Gallery. So I had ex I sort of exhausted that work, the sculpture. I found I found quite I found that I got bored of my work, and I needed to I needed to keep trying to make things that I felt were fresh, things that I hadn't seen. And you know, most of the time, you don't know how to do that. You just kind of wandering around in the dark, wondering what to do. So, I thought that I might uh, take my pinhole camera to Washington. I liked the idea of the, of the, the distorting lens trained upon um, the nation's uh, icons, the White House and the monument. One of, one of my photographs in Washington, I had completely forgotten to uncover the pinhole. And accidentally exposed this sheet of film to light playing in from a hole somewhere else in the camera and dust had collected on the film and the light had illuminated the dust and I processed the film and looked at it and thought what the hell is this and, and then I, I realized that um, that it was beautiful and that I could make a, a picture without the outside world anymore. So this was the beginning of my photogram, <coughs> photogram work and that, that's pretty much uh, been the last 15. Yeah, about 15 years. Yeah. Briefly tell someone, tell the audience what a photogram, how a photograph. Oh yes, Sarah, I should do that. <laughs> so, so you know, I mean, I define a photograph as something that's made with 
that's made with a camera with a lens and a shutter. So the light comes in through the lens, the lens focuses it on the film, which is in the back of the camera, the meaning of camera being dark in space. And the shutter determines how long that light is allowed to fall on the film. So with a photogram, we've, we've taken, we've covered over the lens, and we've, we've, we've sort of walked inside the camera. The camera becomes much larger, we're inside it, the film becomes much larger. The film is a, is a large sheet of photographic paper, colour or black and white. And so we're in this dark space with this light sensitive material, and at that point we can, we can kind of do what we want. We can, we can shine light on it in a variety of different ways, and we can, we, can, um, we, can, we can record the shadows of objects placed upon that photographic paper, or, or there doesn't have to be an object. There could just be light itself, or there could be the transparency of an object, um, a, let's say, um, um, a, a yellow flower. We shine light through a yellow flower on the paper that's sensitive to, to coloured light, we'll get a, an image of the yellow flower. That, that sounded really long-winded, but I... And, and to, to my mind, it's extremely simple, but... And it is technically extremely simple, but because we're so conditioned to photography coming out of a little box from Japan, it, it's hard to get one's head around, but... Um, I guess when we're finished, if anyone doesn't understand, please ask again. But there, there are other qualities of the photogram. I mean, you've, once you started experimenting with these, um, was it through water first that you really understood what the photogram could do? My, my first experiments were along the lines of the dust picture, um, basically dumping things onto onto film and onto uh, onto photographic paper, on powder and um, and yeah. I remember I woke up one morning and thought, okay, I have to do this with water. So. Yeah, I mean, most of my work, I think, comes out of that sort of, um, well, it's a kind of ignorance. <laughs> I mean, it just comes in a way, rather than being premeditated. So, water seemed really an attractive material because it, it was so intimate to the paper. People who've been making photograms in, well, all through the history of photography, particularly in the twenties uh, and thirties. And a lot, of the a lot of the time, the material they used um, was it were sort of man-made objects or cultural objects, wine glasses, revolvers, letters. I like the idea of working with natural materials. And I like this relationship of, um, I, 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 I think the only way to describe it really is intimate. The idea of this material that's being recorded, here in this case water, being in, in absolute contact with the, uh, with the photographic uh, material. Well, also what comes up here is the idea of forms that are they're not made by my hand. They are uh, I would say they're sort of they're the law, they're universal patterns, universal laws. And I, I felt that was more interesting than the idea of an individual mark, which I, I thought of as more an ego mark, which um, then is very limiting, whereas this kind of universal mark I thought would be would be interesting to people anywhere on the earth. Everyone could kind of identify with this.
This is a picture called Ark, A-R-K, and it, it's just made from a single drop of water, a wave from a single drop of water. Ark being the, the idea that this wave, although it's limited in, in size in the photograph, but Conceptually, that wave just keeps going, and it includes so it will include everything, like the ark. At some point, um, while making photographs of single drops of water, I got really frustrated, and I decided to dump a bucket of water onto the photographic paper. And I came up with this title, Now. <laughs> but I think one of the other things that maybe you didn't mention with um, the photograph is the one-to-one -one scale. So that this idea of, of dumping a bucket of water into a, a pool of water is actually what we see is the scale of what you did. And it's this kind of interest between process as well as um, the abstraction that we see. I, I, yeah, that's really important for me this, in the photogram is this idea of things being... When you look at the print in the exhibition, you're seeing a baby the size of the baby, the snake is the size of the snake. And I think, I think there's an honesty in that that is absent from 